In ASP.NET Core, anytime your application needs to log any kind of information, it can make use of logger objects, which you'll declare in your code via the iLogger interface. These logger objects are automatically registered for you during your application startup sequence, so you are free to inject them and use them in any of your microservice classes without any additional configuration. You can use the many methods of the logger object to log events with different levels of severity, like informational events, warning events, error events, and many others according to the needs of your service. By default, these events are sent to your console or terminal, which can tell you exactly what's going on with your application as you run it or debug it in your dev box. However, the console is just one of the possible destinations of your logs and is enabled by one of many logging providers called the console logging provider in this case. There are several other logging providers that allow you to send logs to different places. For instance, .NET applications come with other built-in logging providers like the Event Source Provider, which can collect ETW events that you can later explore in tools like Perfu, and the Event Log Provider, which on Windows machines can send logs to the Windows Event Log, which you can later see in the Windows Event Viewer. There are also several third-party logging providers that can send logs to dozens of places, like the SIG Provider, which sends logs to the SIG Search and Analysis Server, the App Service Provider, which sends logs to Azure App Service, and many other providers like Elma.io, Log4Net, and Log, Serilog, and others. Let's start exploring the logging capabilities of our .NET REST API. And to start with, let's go ahead and let's take a closer look at the current logs that we already have running in our REST API. So if I just go back into my terminal, Ctrl J over here, and I'm going to collapse this for a moment, I'm just going to go ahead and do .NET run, okay, and perhaps I'll maximize this so we can see better. As you can see, we already have multiple logs coming out of the REST API, and these are created by the built-in components of the ASP.NET Core application. Now, if we take a closer look at one of these log lines, so for instance, let's focus on this one, you can already see the different classic components of a log line. So each log line is going to have a log level, Right? This one here, which in this case is just info for information, but could also be warning, error, or a few others. Right, So that's what we know as a log level. Then we have the log category, which in this case says Microsoft.hosting.lifetime. So that's a way to categorize uh, your logs into different groups. And in this case, it's really categorized it according to the component that is producing the log. In this case, hosting.lifetime. Then we also have the event ID, this one over here, it says 14, which is just one way that uh, the owners of that component decided to also categorize this specific event inside the hosting lifetime component. And lastly, of course, you have the, the message, right? Which in this case says, now listening on HTTP, localhost 5115. Okay, so you're going to see that most of the logs that you're going to see all over the place have all of those basic components. The cool thing is that you can also create your own logs that follow the same, the same idea, the same conventions, right? So how to do that? So now let's go ahead and get out of this uh, terminal. So let's collapse this and let's actually stop the server and get back to Explorer view. And what we're going to do now just to get started is to go into problem.cs and over here, we're just going to add uh, one new line here, just after initialize db async, saying that, well, you know what? The database is ready, it's ready to go, right? So to do that, all you have to do is just say app.logger. And in this, I mean, and logger here, by the way, is the logger that is attached to the web application object, right? You see, this is web application.logger, and it's an object of type iLogger. From that logger object, you can go ahead and get access to a bunch of methods that you can use to log with different levels, right? You can see that we have here uh, log critical, debug, log error, log information, log trace, log warning. So you can choose uh, to what level you want to log. And so in this case, let's just do a simple informational message. So log information. And then here you want to, you have a, a bunch of overloads uh, and different ways to use the method, right? But in this case, let's go for the most basic thing here, which is going to be just to put an event ID and a message. So let's say that we decide that for this message, that database is ready, the event ID is going to be five. And then the actual message, uh, I guess our overload is this one over here. The message is going to be just the database is ready. And that's it. Just by doing that, we're going to have a brand new log line that's going to show off in our terminal whenever the application starts. So if we now go back to terminal, and I'm going to clean this, I'll do .NET run once again. We should see now that our new log line is right here. Notice this. The database is ready. 
which again, it has the info log level. It has the game store that API log category because we are doing this directly into our program.cs file, right? So it's just in editing the name of the entire project. And then uh, we have our ID five, and then we have our message. So that is a fairly simple way that you can start writing logs directly from your program.cs file. Now let's stop this. And then, well, what if you wanted to write logs somewhere else? Like, so for instance, what if we wanted to go inside our initialized db async method? I'm going to do F12 here to go inside our data extensions. And here we are in initialized db async, which seems to be a much better place to write our log message because this is the one method dedicated to the actual initialization of the database, right? So how do we do this? Right? Well, in order to actually be able to write logs here, the first thing that we have to do is to request an instance of a logger object that we can use to actually create the logs. And before we can do that, and let me expand this for a moment. Before we can do that, what we have to do is request an instance of another object that implements an interface that is known as iLogger Factory. iLogger Factory is an interface for which you can always request an instance. And from there, you can create any logger that, that you want. So here we're going to say bar logger equals, and once again, we're going to be using the service provider to request or get required service. We're going to say, okay, so I need to get a required service. What is a service? The service is I logger factory. Now that we have the logger factory, we can go ahead and retrieve the actual logger instance. So I'm going to go into the next line here and I'm going to say dot create logger. Okay. So this is a way to explicitly go ahead and create that logger object that we need. And here, as you can see, we can specify the category name. So you can put really any name here. So in this case, let's say this is going to be our DB initializer. Now we do have the logger object that we can go ahead and use to produce our logs. So now I'm going to go back into run.cs and I'm going to get rid of, or actually copy or cut this line. So I'll take it out from run.cs and I'm going to paste it on this other side right here. And instead of using add.logger, I'm going to just use logger. And just by doing that, we should be able to go ahead and produce our log now directly from within initialized DBAC. So I'm going to go back into my console I'm going to clean this. I'll do .NET wrong now. And as you can see, now we have our brand new log line over here, which is very similar to what we had before. But the main difference now is that we are presenting them using the DB initializer category. Notice this DB initializer, right? That's the one that we specified because it's custom. We are creating that now via our own logger that was created from the logger factory. So yeah, that's how you can use iLogger when you don't have access directly to it, like in program.cs. But the good thing is that there's even an easier way to start writing logs from your different components. So in the next lesson, we'll see how to write logs in a simpler way by using the iLogger interface. So if you now go into our uh, repositories and let's go into Entity Framework Games Repository, okay? So let's say that we want to start writing logs over here specifically in our create method, right? So we want to create a log anytime a game gets created. So for that, what we're going to do now is to use another logger object, but instead of using or creating it via the logger factory, we're just going to go ahead and inject it directly into our repository class. So here, let's scroll down a bit. Let's go ahead and declare a, a variable here, private read only, and this is going to be of type iLogger and iLogger needs to have a type parameter. And that type parameter is going to be the same name of your class. So in this case, the class is Entity Framework Game Repository. We're going to be setting that up right there. And then let's give it a name. So it's going to be just logger. By doing this, you're declaring a logger object whose category is going to be actually the fully qualified name of your class over here. Okay, so that's the purpose of the type parameter over here. Now let's go ahead and inject this into our constructor by doing control dot in logger. And let's select the option that says add parameters to Entity Framework Games Repository Game Store Context. I click on that one. And now we have a new parameter in the constructor that receives the logger object, the dependency injection, and then it assigns it to the variable logger. So now we can go down into our create async method over here, and we can go ahead and right away just write a log message. So logger dot log information. And here we can go ahead and write a message. So in this case, let's do a little bit of string interpolation to write the following created game and then we'll say game dot name with price and we'll say game dot price 
And don't worry too much about these little information wiggles that we have over here, uh, because we're going to talk about that in a few lessons. There's another way to write this log message. Uh, but for now, that's good enough for going ahead and just write this simple log information via the logger object. So let's see how that actually works by testing this via Postman. So let's go back into our terminal here. And before running the service, one thing we're going to need is a brand new access token to be used in our post request in Postman, right? Because it requires authorization. So let me just create that access token quickly. Okay, so it's going to be an access token for the role admin and for scope games that write. Okay, so token right there. I'm going to copy my token. And now let's go ahead and clean this and don't let run. And then let's go back into Postman over here and let's go into here we are in the post request. I have prepared a brand new game for us, which is for Horizon 5. And in this case, let's go back into authorization and let me paste my brand new token that I just copied. OK, so we should be ready to go ahead and post our game. So I'm going to click on send. And the game got created. Right. But more, more importantly, let's see what we have in our logs over here. So as you can see at the very end, we have our brand new info message over there, which clearly says that, well, created Game Force Horizon 5 with price $59.99. But also notice that the category for this log is GameStore.API, the repositories that enter the framework games repository. And that is because remember that we declared our log, if we go all the way up, we said that iLogger is of type Entity Framework Game Repository. So the category that you can see here is the class name and it translates into the fully qualified name of the class as the category. And also we have even ID zero, as you can see is even ID zero right there. And that is because when we uh, use the logger over here, we are not specifying any even ID, right? So it just defaults into zero. Yeah, so that's how you can go ahead and very easily start logging messages from your different classes. But one thing that I want to show you is how to present your messages in a slightly different way. So in the next lesson, we'll see how to present our logs in a different way using the JSON logger. What you can see here is the default way of presenting logs using the logger objects in .NET. It's the simple console logger. But it turns to be that there are other ways to present the logs. And one particular way that I want to show you is how to present the logs in JSON format. And so let's now stop our server over here, close that. And then in order to present the logs in a different way, all you have to do is go uh, into program.cs. And what I'm going to do is just, I'll add a line here just before our app object creation. And I'll just say builder.logging.addJSON console. By doing this, I am requesting a different console log formatter for my application, which should output the logs in the form of JSON. So let's run the application and see how the logs look like with this change. So I'm going to open up my terminal over here and I'm going to clean this. And in fact, I'm going to collapse this so we can see better. And then I'm just going to do .NET run. And as you can see, and, and of course it is a bit harder to tell right now, but now each of our log lines are now in the form of JSON. Right. So for instance, you can see one log line right here. This is one log line. Then we have another log line over here and then yet another one over here. Each of them are presented in JSON format. But like I said, it's a bit hard to tell, but that is okay because there are options that we can apply to this formatter so that we can see things in a much better way. So let me do control C to stop this and I'll collapse this. And now what we're going to do is that in the JSON console call here, we're going to specify options. So here we'll say options. And then we'll open up this section here. And now we can say options that JSON writer options equals new. And then we can go ahead and inside this, we can go ahead and define that we do want to see the logs in an indented way. So we'll say indented equals true. Okay, so that should go ahead and present the logs in a much nicer way. So let's go back into our terminal here and I'll clean up this and I'll do .NET run. Let me actually expand the entire terminal here so we can see better. Not that run. And now, of course, we can see things in a much better way. So if we scroll up a little bit, we're going to see all of our logs over here. And then for instance, so let's look at, at this log over here. So we have this log with even ID 14 and we have the log level information. We have the category Microsoft hosting lifetime and we have the message over here. Right. But interestingly, we now also have another element that we were not seeing before, which is the state over here. And so this state pretty much contains the message, but it also contains other things that, ha that have been extracted out of that message. Right. And for instance, here is the address. Right. So the address has been taken out of the message. 
And then we also have the original format over here, right? So notice that original format is kind of the format string that has been used to produce the message that's over here. It says now listening on, and then we have the address. And the address somehow was extracted over here as part of the state, and then the message is the output of that combined string. So that is one capability of the FDNet Core logging system that is known actually as a structured logging. And this is exactly what I wanted to show you that you can present the logs in a JSON format. And it's because I also want to show you how you can create a structured logs so that your messages can be composed of multiple elements that are going to be part of the state. So to start with, let's go ahead and create a brand new game and let's see how it shows up right now before using a structured log. So I'll do control J and I'm just going to go ahead and do .NET run. And then I'm going to go into Postman and I have prepared a brand new game here. This is going to be Super Mario Bros. 3. Yeah, so this is the post call, the post request. So let's go ahead and hit on send. So the game has been created. And remember that you have to use the proper authorization access token over there for this to succeed, which I already have over there. So the game has been created. And then let's go down over here. And here we can see that we do have uh, this message here that says created game Super Mario Bros. 3 with price $29.99. And in the state, as you can see, all we have right now is just a message. And then the original format is the same thing as a message. But the cool thing is that with the structured logging, we can actually pull out the important pieces of this log message into the state. And how to do that? Well, let's just stop the application for now and then collapse this. And let's go back into our Entity Framework Games repository. And I'm going to collapse this and let's go down into our create async method. And so in order to use a structured logging, uh, all you have to do is instead of using string interpolation as we're doing right now, we're going to be removing this uh, dollar sign, remove that. And then in each of these spots where before we were inserting the actual variable, we're just going to put kind of a placeholder, right? Which is going to be the name of the property in the structured log. So in this case, we're just going to type here name. And in the second one, we're just going to leave their price. And then after this, we're going to go ahead and add the actual properties at the very end in the array of parameters, right? So game.name and then game.price. And in fact, if I quickly go back and I mean, this is the way that it should look like, but let me just control C for a moment so that we can see one other thing that I didn't mention is that the way, the reason why you have those squiggles here is that because the .NET compiler is alerting you that you should be using a actually a structure logging as opposed to this approach that we had before with the string interpolation. And that is because as a message template warning is saying here, they don't like the fact that we are potentially changing these log messages with every new call of log information uh, with these uh, different values. What they want to see is that we just uh, stick to the this one, just one template, one single template as it is right now. And then we just add the parameters at the very end. But uh, by doing this, we are able to use structured logging. So let's now see how this changes our messages. So I'll do to J and I'll do, so I'll clean this, I'll do .NET run. And then what we're going to do is go back into Postman. And instead of just creating once again, another game, what we're going to do first is just delete this existing game, right? And for that, let me just first copy my access token. I'll copy my access token. And then the game that we created, Super Mario Bros. 3 is number seven. So let's go to our delete tab over here. And let's go into authorization. Let's go into better token and let's paste that over here. Okay, we have the new token. And then we said that the game is number seven. So we'll put number seven here, there, and then I'll hit send. And then the game is deleted now, right? So it's gone. So now let's go back to post. And now we can go ahead and recreate the game. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit on send. And Super Mario Bros. have been created once again now with ID8. And now let's take a look at the log message. So notice that the message looks pretty much the same. But now we do have some other properties over here. We have our name right there. And we also have our price. So now name and price have been extracted from the original format, from the format template, which is just now one single template. And then name and price got extracted into the state. And then those were used to create the final version of the message. And this is important because when you go into production, uh, your production login system, whichever system you're going to be using for production, will be able to actually pull out these different properties of your state, right? So that you can later query for your log messages, looking for specific values in specific properties of your state as you're using structured logging. If you're not using structured logging and the, and the variables and the values are just hard coded directly inside the message, you will not be able to make that kind of query. 
So storage logging becomes very, very useful when you go into a production environment where you can actually want to query for the different values inside each log line. So yeah, that's how you can use structured logging. And uh, before moving on, what we're going to do is just go back to the original way where we were uh, showing the log messages just as a standard simple console. So let me just close this and let's go back into Explorer and into PromCS over here. And so we will not be using the JSON console anymore because just it's a little bit too verbose uh, for the local environment purposes. So we're going to just go back to that. But we will keep using structured logging, right? It doesn't matter how we render the messages. The important thing is that you, you should be using structured logging in the right spots. Okay, so now that we have this in place, in the next lesson, we will learn how to configure the different log levels for our application. So if you remember, we do have these two files, appsetlist.json and appsetlist.development.json, right? Uh, which both of them will have this login section. And this section is actually meant to configure the log levels. So if you go into log level, we're going to see two entries by default here, each of them representing one of, one of the categories for which we want to configure log levels. And so for instance, this line here says that this is going to be the configuration for all of the log entries that have a category that starts with microsoft.asp.net core. And then uh, the other one here that says default says, so for everything else, you're going to be using this specific configuration. And the value on the right side is the minimum log level that our application is going to be able to present, right? Like in this case, for everything that starts with microsoft.asp.net core, we are only going to be able to see warning messages or higher. And for everything else, we're going to be able to see information messages or higher. Now these log levels have kind of a hierarchy, right? So when you specify one level that immediately either includes or excludes some other set of levels. So what I'm going to do now is just uh, copy and paste just one little section from the Microsoft Docs. It's going to look a little bit ugly, but I just want to paste it here to, to show it to you right here. This is kind of the let me collapse this for a moment. It's kind of the order in which these log levels are set in the hierarchy of levels, right? So by far the most verbose level is the trace level here, which has a value of zero. And that is followed by debug and then information and then warning, error, critical, and finally none. So this means that if we set the level at, at warning value three, nothing that is on the left side, so information, debug, and trace, none of those are going to be presented in the logs in the application. But we will be able to see error and critical logs. And I guess none just means really just don't show anything. Right? That's just turn off the entirety. In the same way, if we say that we want to present messages with trace, uh, the minimum level is going to be trace, uh, that means that everything else is going to be shown because all, all of those are higher in the levels. And let me, yeah, let me just undo this and let's see this uh, kind of in action. And let's see how changes here can affect the application logging. And so let me actually go back to Explorer and we will make changes into absence that development that JSON, which is the, the, the one that's been used for the, the development environment, uh, as opposed to the other one, because that's the environment where we're working on right now, right? So I'm going to be closing that other one and let's focus on absence that development that JSON. And so before making changes, let's go ahead and just run the application very briefly. I'll just run it. And let's see what we get uh, by default. So this is these are the logs that we are getting by default, right? So, and that makes sense. But now what I'm going to do is make a small change in the log levels here so that the default level is not going to be information. It's going to be warning. That means that we are going to be excluding by default all of the informational messages. So let's see, after making that change, I'm going to clean this and I'll do .NET run once again. Notice that it is not that the application is, is still being built. I mean, the application is running right now, right? It's hard to tell, but it is running. Uh, but since we set this to warning, no log messages are being printed at all, even when the application is actually running. And I can prove it because I can go back into Postman over here and I can go into our get all call. And I click on send and it is able to retrieve. Yeah, as you can see, it can retrieve the games, right? Uh, but we don't have any logs here. And that is because our default log level now is warning. And then let me do control C here and then uh, in a similar way, let's say that I want to switch this Microsoft.ASP.NET Core into a much uh, lower level. So I'm going to switch this into trace. That would mean that everything that's related to the Microsoft.ASP.NET Core category is going to be shown off uh, right now. So I'll do this and I'll do dotted run. And notice that indeed, now we have many more logs uh, going on in our application. Right now, let me actually expand this for a moment and let me control C and let's do this once again so we can see better. Okay, there. So notice we have plenty of logs, so many that they are not fitting in the, in the screen, right? And they are actually coming with debug level. You see, this is debug, 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 debug. 
So that is, that is kind of a nice way uh, for you to activate much more logging in your application if you want to see more of the internals of how your application is just uh, booting or how different components of Exynet Core are working. Yeah, so let me control C this and let's minimize this for a moment. Okay, so now let's just stop our server and let's see if we can take care of something that has been bothering me a little bit for a while. And so I'm going to just uh, clean this and let me revert these changes going back to warning and this goes back to information. And if we just do .NET run, what you may have noticed so far is that anytime when we start application, we are seeing the full set of entity framework uh, logs stating that it is pretty much trying to check if we need to run any migrations into our application. And in most cases, there's no need to apply any migrations. So what I'd like to do is to, at the very least, uh, not have to see so many logs about entity framework anytime my application starts. Uh, specifically, any of these uh, logs that is, they're just related to the entity framework core, that database, that command category, right, which they are not really telling me uh, too much. Perhaps I'd like to keep this one here. It's interesting. It's important. The database is, uh, is already up to date, it says, but really nothing else. So how can we change this so we don't have to see those logs all the time? So let's go ahead and stop the server and let's collapse this. And this time we're actually going to go back into absence.json over there. And what we're going to do is just add one more entry over here for the category for which we want to change the log level. So the category, if you go back into the logs once again, is going to be Microsoft Entity Framework Core Database Command. So I'll copy that and then paste it over here. And for that category, what we want to set now is that we only want to see warning message, right? So if there's a warning, let's see it. Otherwise, let's just not display anything. So now I'll do Control J and I'm going to clean up this and I'll do .NET Run. And notice that this time, all we are seeing is just that the migration, the migration, the non-migration were applied, and then we go right away into our DB initializer and the rest of the Microsoft hosting uh, stuff. This way, our logs look uh, much cleaner. There's no need to see so many logs. And so just like this, you can go ahead and play around with log levels as you need uh, to see either more or less uh, login information for your application. One of the things that is going to be very important for you as you move into a production environment is the ability to be able to log each of the requests that are coming into your REST API. And fortunately, there is a built-in feature in ACNet Core that allows you to do exactly that, just log each of the requests. So let's see how to enable that. If you go now into program.cs, the first thing that you want to do here is to well enable HTTP logging. And to do that, what you want to do is just take advantage of your web application object here. And I'm going to do it just before map games endpoints. All you have to do is just say app that use HTTP logging. So that's how you enable uh, that feature so that you can capture and log those requests as they come in. And then the other thing that you want to do is to explicitly configure your log levels so that you can see those logs uh, coming in. Because by default, the log level for those is not really very high. So if you go back into app settings and JSON over here, and I'll collapse this for a moment, what you want to do is the following. So you will go ahead and add another entry here that says Microsoft.aspnetcore.httplogging.httplogging logging middleware. And for that one, you want to bump the level into information, or I guess lower the level into information. And with that in place, it should be ready to start logging your incoming requests. So I'll go ahead and open my terminal over here. And I'm going to make this actually bigger so we can see better. And I'll just do .NET run, start my server. And now I'll go ahead and into Postman, where I have prepared a brand new post request that has a new game here. This is going to be Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. And I'll go ahead and send this post request. So I'll hit on send, can got created. And then let's look at logs. So as you can see over here, now we have a detailed set of logs of this request that, that just came in, which is very important. So we can see, for instance, that this was a post request with the scheme HTTP. Here is the path of the request. Here is the host that received the request. Here we also have the user agent, which gives us a hint of uh, what was the client that sent the request. And then we have a few other things, like for instance, the content type, the length of the content. And then uh, we also have the authorization header here, which we cannot tell uh, because it is redacted. That makes sense. We don't want to have that locked. A bunch of uh, important things, right? And that that is pretty cool. And then if we scroll down, I mean, of course we have the actual our actual log that says that the game got created, but then we also have logs for the response. So we can see now that we have a status code that was 201, 
is the content type of the response, the date uh, on which the response was sent, and then we also have the location header that was created as part of that response. All of these details are now going to be logged for every single request that you send to your REST API. So if I go back into Postman and I go and do a get call for that uh, brand new game, so it's, it's ID 9, so I'll go back here and I'll do ID 9, hit send, I go back here, we're going to see that now we have the log for that request, and you can see that now this is for game 9, right? So this is the get request, and then we have the corresponding resp response down here. And so this is going to be, I think, super useful for you uh, in production so that you can tell actual requests are coming in into your REST API and what kind of responses each of them got. Now let's go ahead and stop this. And what I'd like to do is just to, well, let's minimize this for a moment. What I'd like to do is to not actually show all of those logs for at least not for our development environment. It's going to be very useful for production, I think, but for development environment, it's just going to be too much verbose, uh, too many logs. So what I'd like to do is to do something similar to this, right? So we're going to copy this line, but now we're going to go into app settings that development adjacent, and we're going to paste that line in our login section, log levels. But instead of using information, we're going to be using none. That means that in development environment, we're not going to be seeing any of those requests coming in or coming out. But in production, since we have the other one, the production one is going to overwrite what we have for development and actually show the logs, right? So if we now go back, do Control J. And let's uh, expand this and I'll clean this and I'll do .NET run. And if we go and try once again our request for game nine, hit send, go back to the logs. And as you can see, there are no HTTP logging going on here because we are in development environment. But they should show up still in production.